Um, I'm taking a moment here to record some thoughts on um, the uh, Critical Hits ATS system, uh, specifically the game Santa Maria Infante on the road to Rome 1944. Um, uh, two sort of things by way of introduction. One is that um, I already recorded an introduction to this as I picked up the game to play a few weeks ago, but um, that for some reason that video's not uploading to YouTube no matter how many times I try. So I've had to scrap that. So I've actually finished the game. So, but this is sort of by way of an introduction. Then there's two playthrough videos which um, some people I think have already had seen or had glimpses of because they should uploaded. It should have been after. I didn't realize the first the introduction hadn't uploaded. But anyway, so there'll be two playthrough videos that follow this, and uh, essentially it's of um, uh, I played the. Longest scenario, which is um, scenario seven. Uh, so you can see the components and things, and this isn't an unboxing, etc. But um, it's not a review either. It's just a sort of thoughts on the game. Um, so essentially, what happened was that um, I've had a bit of a troubled history with ATS. Uh, I came really back to. Um, wargaming through uh, Squad Leader and ASL, which um, were games from my youth that I never, I saw in the shops, but I never had the opportunity to buy. And then when I discovered eBay some 10 or 15 years ago, I, uh, I discovered, uh, I, I think it was ASL, and so I, on that, and remembered it, the box cover from my youth. Um, so, and kind of, so, so that was kind of like my first love, as it were. But I, I, there's a bit of a troubled history with that because, as you know, it's a beast and it sort of takes a lot of commitment. So it's a lovely game. I, I think it's great because of the immersion it gives you, um, uh, uh, the sense of fun you get in the storyline um, playing it. But it requires a, a high level of um, a lot of input. From the player or players. So um, I picked up um, the ATS Streets of Stalingrad basic game many years ago and tried that out and it didn't really grab me and the main reason was um, not just that it seemed kind of like a not quite dumbed down but sort of it was trying to it seemed like it was trying to reach for the, um, the scope and kind of like a uh, sense of immersion of ASL um, but without giving the details that ASL uses to get that sort of sense of immersion and scope so you know all different um, all the details are set true about the tanks and so forth so it was but that wasn't so much what didn't grab me but it was the impulse system and as I was playing solitaire and um I just couldn't get into the fact that you, you know, you, you're, you have a target, you're the attacker trying to move across and take, in this case, take these um, factory buildings and you move one unit or one stack of units and then the other side moves one unit or stack of units or fires with them and then you move one or one, so it's one, 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 constant back and forth, back and forth between two different sides. Now, it might feel very different if it was opposed, because then obviously you're both in the action all the time, that's quite exciting. But as a solo player, that's such a drag, because as a solo player, you kind of, you have to put on one hat with one side, and then, you know, you want to take that turn, and then you go to the other turn and put on the other hat. But with this... Um, alternating impulse system you're constantly changing hats and um, so that was a bit of a pain but apart from that as well so it's a pain as a solo player in that sense but apart from that also I found it very difficult to kind of get the sense of um, of uh, like coordinating and producing an attack or an offensive in the sense that because 
you know, say I've moved this unit, then the enemy would sort of fire or respond to it. So then I'd, because they had sort of moved out or they had become exposed, then I'd quickly respond to that. So it became kind of like a game of tit for tat, tit for tat. So you do that, so I do this. Now I've done this, so you do that. And now you've done that, so I do this. So it was kind of like, um, this isn't an inherent problem with that system, but it, it tended to, for me at least, to devolve into that, rather than, you know, if I had the plan like, right, these go up that way, these go up that way, and these provide covering fire, that would sort of disintegrate quite quickly because of these little developments happening all along. So it felt like um, just a chaotic free-for-all rather than the sense of, okay, platoon one go in, uh, platoon two go in, and platoon three back up. Um, you know, executing a plan is what I'm trying to say. So I like, I like that in SL, the sense of executing a plan that I was getting more than in the ATS where it's felt like this chaotic free for all. So, but I still felt, you know, it's a system that gets a lot of love and attention. So I still wanted to try it. I picked up, um, the, uh, uh, core module, the Tobruk, um, I, I don't know, it's the desert one at some point. I pulled that out, you know, many years ago again, and again, I just couldn't get back into it. It kind of lay flat for me. Then here I am in Italy now, and a fellow sold me this very good deal along with some other games, Santa Maria, Maria Infante. So it's about the road to Rome. It's about where I'm living. So it's kind of very topical. So I thought I'd give it another try. So that's my story leading up to ATS. And um, I'm happy to say that it started to shine much more for me this time. Um, and essentially that's for two reasons. And they are both optional rules that come in the game, which the first chain, well, they both changed the activation, the alternating impulse activation system. The first one is that... Um, you roll a d10, you halve it, round up, and that's as many impulses as you can take this go. So instead of having one up activation and another tit-tat, tit-tat, I could activate between one and five um, activations on the side before it moves to the same on the other side. So I'm essentially, I'm not having to change hats as quickly, and I'm also able to coordinate a bit more, like, you know, this fellow runs up, okay, get some opportunity fire, but then the, the other... This covering guy covers for him, and then another fellow runs up. So, it I could see the action being coordinated as it unfolded more than before. If that was going to happen, it would all be broken up so quickly. It would be it was difficult for me to hold in my mind that sort of picture of what's happening. Um, it does happen, but it's it's for me it was harder to kind of step back and take that overall picture. It, I got it, so I enjoyed it more with the, having more impulses, one side taking more impulses at a turn. Then the other optional rule um, was to uh, intermix the fire and the movement phases. So normally you, you have sort of off-border off -board artillery, indi I call it indirect fire phase of that, that's simultaneous for both sides. Then you go to the fire phase and then you alternate impulses and then you go to the movement phase and alternate impulses of movement and then you have a tidy up phase and that's the end of the turn. But th th again, for me, that was like a, r a, a real pain because I'm kind of like, okay, so I, I have to plan ahead for the turn. Who's going to fire and then have them fire and then I go to the movement. But because of this kind of alternating impulse, that planning wasn't, didn't really, you know, either I want to plan and do the whole thing, or I kind of want the chaotic free for all. So it felt like I was having to do a bit of both. Um, it didn't, it didn't sit, sit well, but this way, mixing fire and movement was beautiful. So it just went really fluidly. And again, with those multiple activations at a time, I could get in a couple of fire shots and a couple of movement shots, a couple of moves. Um, so, you know, I could sort of run a squad or two forwards under covering fire all in one go. With opportunity fire happening, but without having to stop 
that move one or two squads of the opponent. So um, it really started going well for me. Now um, I just want to say so. If you want to see me enjoying the game, and I think Adam Fuse had scratches, um, then watch the two following videos. Um, otherwise, if you want to see how the aid system plays, how ATS itself works, for an in-depth look, then go to MJ Leons, or Lyons, that's M-J-L-Y-O-N-S. Go to his YouTube um, channel. And he's at the moment he's putting up um, see how it plays videos as he calls them. So, so you know he goes through very slowly the turns as he's playing it as um, as it goes out. So then you can see if you're learning the game or you, you just want to see how it plays then um, in depth then do that. If you just want more of a flavour of someone having fun with a game, you can watch mine. Um, Okay, so uh, yes, what more can I say? Yes, the first thing perhaps is that the line of sight was a bit of a bugbear. Because, um, you know, it's the, that classic thing with games where you're used to one thing, say, for example, the ASL model, and then you have to get, you sort of look at the map, it looks kind of similar, but no, that, that is a different model for line of sight here. So, um, Essentially, I found it a bit strange in that, um, as I understood it, say you've got this is this is the highest part of a, the, the this is the ridge main ridge running along which the Americans have to battle up. So here's a higher highest part of it. Well, that's in fact higher, and these are lower, going lower and right down here into these ravines and sort of valleys. Um, as I understood the uh, ATS um, line of sight rules, um, if say uh, I'm on this side of the hill, uh, I can fire at someone on the other lower down on the other side of the hill. So I could fire at someone lower down on this side of the hill and on the other side of the hill, unless there's seven hexes in between. So um, intuitively, it does doesn't feel right because you know you kind of know that although this is just like a pancake, in effect on the schema here, you know that this is a ridge. So the top of the ridge is here, so that goes slightly down there, that goes slightly down there. So if I'm there, there's something in between me, you know, a bit of a hill. The th so it's, it's harder to see that side than that side. If I'm on this side of the hill, it's, I can see that side, but I sh intuitively it doesn't seem right that I can see that side just as equally well. Um, so that was strange, and it took some getting used to, but you know... You, that's the way it is, you just get used to it. Um, another thing that I should mention was that um, I have, this is from 2002 or three, I think, it's the ATS rulebook version 1.95. Now, um, that's, um, that's old rule, so, so they're on like, ATS 4.2 or something like that now version and really you need to get those um, or, or get some sort of kind of updating because these rules um, the first thing is is that there's no um, it's just not clearly broken down so um, I don't know if you can see that there but you know, I've got scenario cards so 3.5 scenario cards and here 3.6 counters and the typeface is not that much bigger. There's not a very big gap. It's you know it's hardly a different to see that that's about scenario cards. And now you start under the counters. I've highlighted it just so you can see it. So the rules they're kind of nicely broken down, but they're just um, you, know, you can see like this page. Where does one section of the buildings begin, and then another section? Okay, you can see that because you've got pictures. But where does one section begin and another end? It's hard to tell, so you know you're working through looking for 
what bit of the rule is. So, um, but that wasn't what I want to say. What I really want to say is that in this game you have bunkers in this module, and they're essential because as the um, as the Germans, you're defending. Um, this is part of the Gustav line, and you're, the Americans are coming up. So you have bunkers, you have minefields, you have wire, you have gun emplacements, you have trenches, and um, bunkers, and, and they weapon emplacements, trenches, and bunkers all use, and also buildings you can mean you use something called full cover. So normally you have improved cover, good cover, and you know they just give shifts on the fire table. And then full cover means that you, essentially you kind of ducked down so you're not, um, you can enter it when you're fired upon and then that you essentially uh, you can't be got at until someone comes adjacent to you. Now in the, these 1.95 rules, as I understood it, and it put, took a bit of deciphering and questioning to folks on Ball King Geek, um, if you're in full cover you cannot fire out. So you're in a bunker to get the proper benefit of a bunker, which is full cover, because otherwise it's just good cover, the same as any old building. To get the benefit of full cover, you cannot fire out. So why are you in a bunker with a machine gun? Do you know what I mean? You just can't cover when you're supposed to cover. Otherwise, you're just in good cover and you get picked off really quickly. Well, some kind soul sort of um, helped me out about the updated rules to show me that... Um, in the updated rules, you can fire out of full cover, in a, or at least from a bunker. So then it made sense, and then the, the game really started shining, because before that, I was, um, it felt like the ATS system felt good, and there was a lot of promise to it, but some rules didn't make sense like that with bunkers, and um, the, the, the rule book was a pain to sort of find things through and um, so it showed promise but I wasn't really think, having fun with it and with the latest version the rules some help from people and sort of better um, clearer paragraphing the game really started to shine and those two optional rules that I told you about it really started to flow well and I enjoyed it um, so uh, Oh yeah, and then another thing is with the off-board artillery, indirect artillery. Um, the the scenario that I played um, had two lots for the Americans, one for the um, Germans, and it actually dominated the game. I had massive um, casualty rate, partly because of I was just sort of playing quite gung ho, you know, just for fun. Um, but partly also because. Um, you have a what's called a contact number, so you have to roll six in this case or less on a d10, and you have contact, so then you can call in fire. And there's no slight ammunition limit or so forth. In this version of rules, um, all that happens is that if you don't get contact, then the next time you roll for contact, it's one point harder, so the next time you get contact on a five or less. If you miss that, then the next time it would be contact with four or less, like that. So you get a diminishing rate of returns. And, and so as you lose contact, you're less likely to get contact and you're, it's harder to get contact. And so you're less likely to get contact, get harder to get contact. And so that in, in the end, like with the Americans, they completely lost all contact, whatever that was supposed to mean, <laughs> with their um, batteries of off-board artillery and the, the Germans kept it throughout the game um, they were fortunate enough to and be, because of the terrain here you've got like open terrain you have to move across that artillery really dominated um, the game and that's probably very realistic and it was quite fun but you know I, I did wonder about that why is that was because if someone was unlucky with their contact rolls, didn't have artillery, it would have been a very different scenario. I didn't know if that would swing balance um to one side or the other too much. Um, uh, I understand that in the uh, present rule version, you don't have those that same diminishing returns on the contact number. Instead, you do have an ammunition limit. 
So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, one thing, interesting thing to mention is that smoke is really powerful in this because uh, if you're used to ASL, it just kind of creates a smallish modifier um, to fire into or through it. And here it's a massive modifier, so it's really effective. And, uh, well, you do need it in a game like this, like I said, but it doesn't protect you from off-board artillery, obviously. Um, and it's easier to get in this. Like, in the ASL, you have to roll to see if you manage to, you know, f find the right opportunity and get that grenade out. In this, it's just automatic. You just have an automatic number based on, I think, a third of your squads or something like that. You know, you, you get that many smoke grenades and use and also you can use smoke from your off-road artillery so anyway that's just kind of like a side note then one last sort of thing that i feel i have to mention is that um there weren't enough counters well there's two things about the counters the counters are lovely by the way um and uh, some of them particularly were really chunky so they felt really like uh, i think it was the tanks yeah they're really nice chunky counters um, if you buy this module at present, it comes in what they call the tabletop version. So this, the ATS was essentially an answer to ASL, and part of its selling treatment was that you have bigger counters, bigger hexes, bigger maps, and you're not sort of so cramped and squinty. Um, but th now they've gone sort of, they've backtracked on that. So now this module is out of print, but you can buy... The same, I understand exactly the same game, renamed as um, the Bracky Road or something like that, because it's on the this is the Bracky Mountains Ridge, so it's something to do with the Bracky along the Bracky Road or Bracky Bracky Ridge, something, um, and it's in their tabletop version, which is smaller counters and smaller hexes. But anyway, back to my thing about the counters was that um, there's both. Too few and too many counters in the game. Now, too few in that the, the scenario that I tried, you needed seven M um, for um, American tanks, and there's only six in the counter sheet, um, which is naughty, especially because um, there's also tons of other. Uh, tanks that you never need they're just not in the scenario so um, okay I bought this game uh, uh, second hand but um, it still comes to me as you know it influences my uh, relationship with the company that produced this game uh, it, it was unpunched um, and so I got it as it was and if I bought this game first hand, I would have been well annoyed that like half of these tanks, and the same with the, on the American side, half of the tanks that are printed on the sheet, they're not needed in the game, they're not used at all. So you, I would, would feel like I was paying for a whole bunch of cardboard that I don't need, and that would make me angry. But I understand that probably I'm not paying more for it, because it's probably cheaper to you know, get a print, massive print run of... A, set of German tanks and bung them in different modules that only bits of them are needed in each module that's probably actually cheaper for me and the publisher too but you pay a price for that you skimp on that and you pay the price in that public relations and that I'm like what do I need all these counters for couldn't I have had one more American tank that I actually need and less of all this stuff that I don't need. But also, I ran out of um, fire and move markers. You need tons of fire and move markers, and there weren't enough. So again, you know, I got a standard um, marker sheet. When I needed the standard marker sheet plus the same again and fire and move markers, and not all those extra ones that I didn't need. So that's you're saving on money, and you're but you're skimping on public relations, which is not a good thing. Um, so yeah, that's just an observation because um, Critical Hit does have a kind of like a strange, a bit of a strange business sense in the sense that I get that he's a bit paranoid that at a second ha secondary market, which creates a wide fan base for Critical Hit games, is not supported, i.e. Vassal modules, um, 
uh, because they felt that people were asking for VAS and nozzles who hadn't bought games from Critical Hit. Well, A, they might have bought games from shops that had were selling Critical Hit games, and B, does it really matter if people are talking about the game, they're excited, the buzz is growing, um, people are still buying for you? Do, I don't know. I, I would wonder if le once they released some Vassal modules, did he actually lose sales there, um, of his modules, um, or, or, or of the hard copy modules? Or if he had kept up with them, would they have gradually trickled up? I understand that it's a lot of upkeep, but I think he, again he kind of want he kept it close to his chest instead of letting it out. Let the fans take control of it and develop it, and let let the fans and the fan base ride with the game instead of kind of restricting everything and just saying no. You know, this is mine. You can only do with it what I say, and you have to pay a hefty price for that. So um yeah. So, um, I think that's my intro. I just uh, finally want to say, because essentially what happened to this game, okay, so I came to it after, a long time after ASL, and I've now come to appreciate it for the sort of fluid, fast-moving bit of fun that it is. Um, and then what it got me in mind to was to go to OST, Old School Tactical, which I had a, when that first came out, um, I downloaded, I bought and downloaded the um, print and play version of that, and um, was really kind of excited, you know, to try out to compare it to tactical games that I do have, and was really disappointed that it had this impulse system, the same as this, back and forth, hit and tap, hit and tap. Um, but then since I got into that impulse system, eventually, just now, with ATS, it brought me back to old school tactical, so I gave that a second go. So, um, I just sort of, I, th I think I'll do a separate little video about OST. I didn't film my game of it, which is now finished, but just sort of chat about that and compare it to ATS. But, um, I just sort of made a few notes that I think essentially... So, um, for ATS, I think its essential feature is the impulse sequence. I think that's kind of the thing that stands out for me that made it different at, 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 when it first came out and still, for me, makes it different. Then it's coupled with a kind of semi-simpler ASL. Um, I say semi-simpler because, um, you know, it's not simple. There's still quite a lot to it, and that there's a lot of crunchy bits to it. A lot of you know options that you can have. Uh, you know, you have Pacific theater stuff with um, caves and all that kind of thing. Then you have desert stuff with sanglers and all that kind of thing. So you know, there's lots of little details that you can get into. But the the the, the mechanics of the game are simpler than ASL. It's not just less detailed, so it doesn't really compare with the. ASL starter kits because the ASL starter kits take the kind of more um, I don't want to say complicated but not the more sort of uh, let's say complicated just for the sake of it the more kind of complicated mechanics of ASL and then take out a lot of the details to make it simpler to get into this basically has simpler mechanics and uh, it's kind of edged towards as many details as ASL. Obviously it hasn't gone quite as ridiculously far, but it's a, a, it, but it, 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 it's simpler mechanics don't rule out a ton of details that it's quite happy to embrace. So in that way, it kind of shows its roots from as a, as a kind of like ASL light stroke clone, stroke mimic kind of thing. It's not a clone, but you see, it's kind of taken some of the DNA from ASL, not really in the mechanics or anything like that, but in what it's trying to be, you know, what it's trying to evoke, that close-up tactical. It wants to be the contender to ASL. I think it does a good job, you know. It, um, I didn't think so when I first picked it up. That impulse system just bugged me too much. With the two optional rules, it um, 
creates a much better game in my mind um, that is that, that can be comparable to ASL. Whereas before it was, I think, maybe it would have been fun as this chaotic free-for-all of face-to-face. -face. But now I think it can be just as much tactical. I don't know, not quite as much as ASL, because ASL just does have that. Um, yes, it's very gamey, but it's, um, you still get a bit more of a sense of, no, 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 it's a different way of doing this, of executing a plan. Because in the game that I played, you know, essentially I was moving guys around one end of the ridge, moving guys around the edge, other edge of the mid, and move, moving some guys up the middle of the ridge. And I sort of formulated a basic plan of attack at the beginning of the scenario and more or less carried it out and then surprised um, myself by the Germans actually carrying out a counter-attack later on which I thought they would never would have had the strength to do. Um, so yeah it does, so I sort of take that back what I was just saying, I think it does do that same kind of thing, it, it enables you to feel that nit really itty, nitty gritty tactical execution of a plan but in a different way from ASL in a kind of Yes, a bit more chaotic way and with much simpler mechanics. So it it it's um it you go through the mechanics quicker, though I do think it took me about ten hours to play um that scenario, so uh it's still quite an involved game. Um not as involved as OST, which I'll save for another video. So I think that's all I can say about ATS now, um, except for, you know, what I say during the playthrough videos. Um, okay. Yeah. So the only sort of, the main gripe that I left um, ATS with, and it is tied to that impulse thing, so even though... Um, I was having between one and five activations at a time. With that, because you, because of the impulse system, you're always scanning around for what is the best move or shot to make this impulse. So you can imagine you've got one side arrayed here and one side arrayed here. It's this side's impulse. So you say, okay, which guy must I absolutely activate now before the other side activates? So you're always looking for that, that guy or that stack, say, okay, I have to activate him before he gets fired on by these. So you kind of, there's quite a lot of dictation to me because of the impulse thing. Instead of like thinking, okay, this is the plan. Who needs to move out or do something first because of the plan? So um, ATS still has that for me in that because of the impulses, you're kind of playing to that impulse mechanic more than, I think I'm just <laughs> contradicting some of what I said before, um, but yeah, you so you're still playing to the mechanic quite a lot, um, but it's obviated by those, um, what I mentioned before. Um, so anyway, yeah, it was fun. Um, it was quite a lot of time commitment and a bit of head scratching of the version 1.95 rules um, until I got updated. Um, but it was worth it. I'm glad I did it and I, I'll get back to it. Though it's strange that I played the biggest scenario because it's in this module because it's the, the one that seemed to sort of promise the most. It's got tanks and infantry. There's a lot of the scenarios in here only have infantry and yeah it seems that's it it seems strange that you've got a big map and this was the only scenario out of i think 14 or 12 lots of scenarios which is nice the only one that used the whole map the others some of them you know used that much of a map like an a5 sheet size or an a4 size space of the map which is fine you know because then you get lots of different variations some very small scenarios even some longer scenarios and kind of quite small areas, but it did seem a bit of a shame that there was only one main scenario using the whole bit of the map. Um, but there you go.
uh, still nice package.